Samira. Yeah, it was her nose. It was just the most perfectly formed, like little button nose, and she was premature. So I was just amazed by how perfect her little nose was. Welcome to Still a Part of Us, a place where moms and dads share the story of their child who was stillborn or who died in infancy. I'm Winter. And I'm Lee. We are grateful you joined us today. Please note that this is a story of loss and has triggers. Thanks to our lost parents who are willing to be vulnerable and share their children with us. If you're listening to this podcast, just know that on our YouTube channel, there are pictures and videos that are related to the stories that are being shared. Subscribe and share it with a friend that might need it and tell them to subscribe. Why? Because people need to know that even though our babies are no longer with us, they're still a part of us. Thank you so much for coming on and chatting with us today, Farah. I really um, am very looking so forward to having you tell the story of Samira. So thank you. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you kind of based out of and um, what do you do? Yeah. Um, so I live in Northern California and um, I am actually a labor and delivery nurse. Um, so very um, involved in this world. Um, yeah. And yeah, that's a big part of my life. That yeah, I was gonna ask you what are you originally from California area then? Yeah, I am not from where I'm living now. Um, like I'm from like the Bay Area. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> okay, <it's> pretty expensive. <laughs> so yes, <laughs> yeah. yeah okay. I went to school. I was a nurse somewhere on the East Coast, and then I decided to come back to California to be closer to family. Awesome, and that's always that's always great. And uh, what do you like to do in your spare time when you're not working? <laughs> I'm not, I'm yeah. Sure. <laughs> um, yeah, like. Right now, honestly, it's a lot of like TV. It's like, you know, some like when I just need to like, <laughs> like relax at the end of the day, um, it's um, really kind of some trashy TV. <laughs> oh, uh, and you, then, yeah, that guilty pleasures. I mean, it's, it's a real thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, good fun. Okay. And then tell me a little bit about what your family looks like right now. And, and at yeah. the time that Samira was born. Sure. Yeah. I have um, a very non-traditional family. Um, I'm a single mom by choice. Um, at the time that Mira was born, I was living, actually, I have, um, well, I call them my host sisters. So I have two um, girls in their 20s who live with me. Mm-hmm. And it's a long story, but I taught English abroad for a couple of years and I lived with oh. their family in another country and they became like my second family. And so, oh. um, yeah. So at the time they had come over for a visit and then COVID happened and they got stuck here. So they were living with me for a while. Out of necessity, really? Yeah. Like their country, like literally closed its borders. They couldn't yeah. go home. <laughs> there were so many people that that happened to. So they were stuck in the country that they were visiting for a long mm-hmm. time. Yeah. Well, that was awfully, awfully kind of you for that, for them to be able to stay with you. Yeah. And okay. And so they are still living with you then? They're still with me, and um, I now have a um, one-year-old daughter, and they are helping me with her. So it's been really great. Oh, that's that's great. Okay, yeah. well, they you were able to go home. They went home and came back. So they good. Did. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. But they're also okay. But they also decided to come back and help, and that is that yeah. is great. Yeah. You mentioned earlier that you are a non-traditional family. Um, you have kind of a non-traditional family. So tell me a little bit about. What made you to decide on that, um, this route? And just kind of tell me a little bit about how um, you did get pregnant with Samira. Sure. Yeah. I always knew I wanted to be a mom. Like that was yeah. like um, never a question when I was young. I was always babysitting my cousins and I just mm-hmm. loved kids and I just had this like desire to be a mom. And so when I got to my late 20s and um, not great in relationships, I was like joking with my friends, like, oh, I'll just do it on my own. And then when I got into my thirties, I was like, Oh, actually maybe I really will do that. <laughs> so yeah. 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 Um, and then in terms of like how you get pregnant, like I had no idea if I had fertility issues or not. Yeah. Um, Cause you know, if you're not trying, you don't know. Yep. Um, but I knew that I didn't, if I didn't have to, I really didn't want to get pregnant in a doctor's office. I just, yeah. So I um, was at like my options and, um, did like a lot of research and um, decided to try to get pregnant at home using like um, um, frozen sperm from a sperm bank. Oh, okay. So that was my, 
Yeah. And they, they will, especially during COVID, they would actually ship it to you. You had to have like a provider sign for it. Oh, um, okay. But yeah, so like you could basically do it yourself at home. Um, and so I did do, like, I did um, try that. And also just like taking a sperm. That's like a whole nother, like a whole nother. Ex- exactly. But you felt good about the decisions you made yeah. in regards to yeah. that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And I found a midwife actually. So I didn't do it at home. I ended up going to the midwife's practice. Um, okay. And she did like an IUI, not monitored um, in her office and it didn't work. Okay. And so I was oh man, like that was like $1,500. I was like, I don't know if I can do that like every single month. Um, yeah, especially if you're not sure about any fertility issues. Because right now, I mean, yeah. it's just the first attempt, right? And so that's, that's yeah. a little tricky because sometimes you're like, okay, was that because it just didn't work because it was an IUI? Oh, and right. um, it, so an IUI stands for intrauterine insemination. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, they go like into the uterus, which I couldn't do at home. At home, yes. it's called the ICI. Um, and so I thought that was like a better chance, but also like not being monitored because there's no ultrasounds. Like I was just doing like the ovulation little Me- strips at method. home. Like okay. Guessing. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so I, my sister had actually told me about her um, friends had found this app <laughs> and basically an app for like all sorts of different, like, um, sperm donors or egg donors, surrogates, like, um, but it was like not run by a sperm bank it was kind of just like a free-for-all which at first I was like no 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 I'm not going to do that okay and then after this first attempt I was like actually let me look at this and just check it out yeah and so yeah it's, it's kind of like a dating app like you kind of like read profiles <laughs> and you swipe and you connect um uh-huh. and then you talk and you do your own research like um the sperm donor I found he like gave me his like background like his medical information ancestry genetic reports um STI reports and yeah, and so I found the sperm donor on the app. So Whoa. Pretty, pretty modern. <laughs> yeah, that is super modern. And so does that happen the exact same way, though, that he donates somewhere and then it gets shipped somewhere? Is that, I'm assuming it's it, probably sort of similar, though. It can. Like you can choose to go that route and um, go through like then a sperm bank and have it um, frozen and like tested and all that. Yeah. I decided not to do that. Okay. So, um, we just met up, signed some paperwork, like met face to face and like mm-hmm. I felt good about it. And um, he did his thing, gave me his sample and then I um, got myself pregnant. Oh, and you did. So you did ICI? I at home. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Yep. And what does that stand for? Just so just for um, our audience. I think it's, I'm pretty sure it's intracervical insemination. So it's yeah. Just we're like, yeah, I think it's, not, probably as, it's right. not as invasive. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, yeah, not as far, yeah, not as far in. (laughs) Okay. And so you did it yourself and you were able to, um, do that just fine. Yeah. And yeah, it took a couple of tries. Um, but then I got pregnant. Okay. When you were still kind of doing the, just like you were doing strips on maybe when you were ovulating and all that jazz, right. Also when you did it at home. Okay. So a couple of tries, um, and then you got pregnant. Like, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it took, like, I was, like, I had made, actually did make an appointment with the fertility clinic because it had taken, you know, like, five tries over seven months, and I was, like, maybe I just need to go, and, like, so I did have an appointment, and, of course, they, they booked, like, it was, like, four, five months out, so. Of course, yes. Yeah. Um, anyway, so by the time I got pregnant, my appointment was the next month, so I was oh. very happy to come here. You're, like, that worked out. Cancel the other appointment. Yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> okay, so you are, um... So now you're pregnant and tell me when you, when you actually did the, the pregnancy test, like what was your reaction? Was it cause you had, ha- you'd already had a couple of negative tests at least. Right. So what right. was your reaction when you finally got the positive I on that? I was surprised. I was, I mean, I think like everyone, like I was like, oh my gosh, like it worked. And then I was like, oh my gosh, did I make the right decision? <laughs> like it's real now. Like, yeah. And I've been working and I had been like thinking about this for so long. And then yeah. it was like, it was like real. Yeah. You're like, whoa, okay. Well, that is, that's super exciting. And did you end up telling people kind of right away or, or what did you do? I did. In my head, I wanted to wait, but then such a physical <laughs> person, I was like, I don't have like a husband to like share this with, you know, yeah. like I needed to get it out and tell someone. Yeah. Um, so I think I, I called like my best friend, um, called two people at first, my best friend and then my cousin, who's also another like best friend Yeah, yeah. and told them right away um, and was just like, 
I was like on a walk. I was like walking and like I told my best friend and it was just like like screaming on the phone, you know, like, like you know, it's so no, you got to get excited. I th- it is exciting news. So that's awesome. How fun. And oh, I, I was actually going to ask. So your family, were they were they on board with helping you? I mean, like with the whole idea of getting pregnant without a partner or anything like that? Super, super supportive. Yeah. I have, awesome. I'm very lucky. Yeah. That's amazing. Cause it's, yeah, it really can be tricky sometimes and yeah. navigating that. So, well, awesome. <laughs> and then did you, so th- uh, can you also just out of context, tell me when Samira was born and, or when you got pregnant, I guess is maybe a better question. So we can kind of get timelines on how yeah, that works. I- got pregnant in March of 2021 and she was due in December of 2021. Um, okay. And so it's just one of the end of July. Yeah. And still so very, um, very much into the pandemic, kind of right in the middle of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, when you started going to see the doctor, like what did you, obviously, uh, I, a lot of times they just say, oh, wait eight to nine weeks and then start going in. Is that about when you started going in to see your um, provider? Yeah. So like I said, I'm a, I am a labor and delivery nurse and I chose to deliver and, um, at the hospital that I work with and mm-hmm. use the doctors that I work with. Yeah. And so I had scheduled my first appointment and like appointments are hard to get anyway. So I think it was like nine weeks or 10 weeks, which is actually not that late. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's like, um, right on basically. Yeah. But when the, my doctor, he saw that I was on his schedule, he actually texted me and was like, do you want to get in earlier? And I was like, no, I can wait. It's okay. I'll be like a normal patient. <laughs> That's nice. That so was really sweet. Yeah. He was like, yeah. congratulations. So, um, oh, cool. but, um, but actually like I had started spotting pretty early on. Oh, okay. um, and so I had, so yeah, so I started spotting like, you know, like maybe five or six, like pretty early. And so this is where like being, uh, like doing what I do, like it was, I felt like it kind of messed with my head a little bit. Yeah. Um, cause I feel like if I was a normal person, I probably would have gone in and like gotten checked out but like in my like my labor and delivery head I was like well it's just spotting it can be normal and it can um yes it can be very common and um like I'm like unless I'm like bleeding bleeding like I'm not going to go in and get checked out um yeah so I didn't and kind of like let it it was like and it would come and go and it wasn't a lot and so it was like I was like worried but like but not you know yeah um and so, but it was eating at me, but I was like, I don't want to go in. Like, especially because if I went in, like everyone at work would know I was pregnant. And oh, like that was and really you, early. Right. And you were trying to keep it sort of on the down low for a minute, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, but at one point at work, I was spotting and it was just like, I was just like too like emotional about it. And I was um, working with an older nurse and I just like, I told her, and she was like, just get checked out. Ask one of the doctors. You don't have to like, and so... Yeah, so I asked yeah. one of our um, residents, and like, I like pulled them aside, like, and I was like, hey, like, obviously it wasn't a busy night, and it was like, I'm pregnant, and I'm spotting, and then I just started crying, and it came out of nowhere, like, I just started like crying in front of her, and she was like, a little, ang- like, she didn't, I didn't have to ask to get checked. She was like, let's check you, come on, let's go. Oh good. Um, yeah. So luckily, like, our um, triage area is totally empty, and so she she did a check, um, an internal, and oh, at seven, okay. it was seven weeks. And, um, there was the heartbeat and it was like such a huge relief. And it was the first time I had I had my appointment yet. Oh, and so you got to see her, oh. the little heartbeat. Yeah. yeah. So it was like the perks of like, of my job too. It was like, oh, yeah, like- yeah, that was, that, that is nice and kind of reassuring, but it it's, yeah. it's funny. Cause I, when you said it was kind of like being an L and D nurse was kind of messing with your brain. And I was like, you're kind of right. Like having working in healthcare, you're just like, Oh no, it's fine. It'll be fine. It's going to be fine. It'll be fine. Like, like we see so many patients come in that are like freaking out because of just li- one little thing. And so you don't yeah. go check it out when you probably should. Right. You're like, I'm not going to do that. For, not that like, I'm, I'm especially I'm now I'm like, I'm like, come in, come in, come in. Like I'm, I want to like yeah. give that, you that reassurance. So like yes. in my head, I was like, I don't want to like go in just for like, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So it does mess with you. Right. Um, at the time that she, the resident did the the ultrasound. Obviously, it was just to make sure that the baby was okay, mm-hmm. and that. But was there anything else that she noted while she was um looking around? I or and no. it might have just been really quick too. That's the other thing. I just you know sometimes you can look quick, quickly or, um, 
and maybe see something. So I'm just wondering if she saw any hemorrhages or anything yeah. because you were spotting. No, she, I don't think she was really like, I mean, there wasn't a lot of bleeding even at that point. So she wasn't really, I don't think she really looked um, too much. And it was like an unofficial like little right. check, you know, like, yeah, um, it was kind of just like, and she didn't actually, she measured, she didn't measure the the baby and it was measuring right on like my, oh. my date. Yeah. And right. so I knew like, it was okay. It was growing. A baby was growing appropriately. And she didn't, I mean, if there was anything obvious, she didn't see it. So, so yeah, it wasn't like an in-depth. Yeah. Okay. That's nice to get confirmation. <laughs> Go regardless. You had your appointment, your official appointment. How long ago after that? Like two, I want to say like two weeks. And of okay. course, like I might've spotted like once or twice, but it was like, by the time I had my appointment, it had been like many days. And so okay. when the doctor asked like, Oh, are you like spotting? I was like, well, I did, but like not anymore. So it was like, great, mm-hmm. like resolved or like not an issue, you know? Yeah. So it was like, fine like we're moving on you know like normal yeah. yeah and then at that visit did they also do an ultrasound they did awesome yeah. so we got to see baby yeah. again yeah yeah wonderful and and how did that look I mean anything at the time that was concerning um that the doctor mm-hmm. saw or com- commented on no no because like sometimes like bleeding can be caused by like like a little like you know like a like a little bit like you know like they can see on the ultrasound something and like he didn't see, I mean, he didn't really see anything or say anything. So okay. it was kind of just like, well, maybe it's just like normal little first trimester spotting. Um, yeah. Then of course, like, I don't know, a couple of days after the appointment, like I was spotting it on, of course. Like, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, You're like, of course. <laughs> it always happens. You go to the doctor yeah. and then everything goes to pot. <laughs> um, okay. And then uh, how are you feeling? Like, um, how's, how's the first trimester treating you in regards to like sickness? Were you feeling okay? Really feeling good, a- actually, like a little bit of like maybe nausea, but not like nothing, nothing bad. Like it was actually pretty, besides the spotting, it was a pretty easy first trimester. And I actually like, I had had this, this trip planned. It was a canoe trip uh-huh. um, in, in the Midwest with a friend for her birthday. And when I first got pregnant I, and we talked about it, I was like, it should be fine. Like it should, as long as, you know, we can play it as it goes, but yeah. like yeah. I'd already committed and I really wanted to go on this trip. Mm-hmm. And as it got closer in the spotting and I was kind of like back and forth and I even talked to the doctor, I was like, is it safe to go? And, and it, he said, yeah, like, I mean, it would be like, especially at the time when I wasn't spotting anymore, he was like, it, sh- it should be, you know, it's what you feel comfortable doing. Right. Right. So I did go and because I really, in my head, I was like, I want to be this like really strong pregnant person, like this, like, yay, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, you do kind of want to be like, I'm bearing a child and I'm yeah. doing a canoe trip. Like, yeah, you do want yeah. to be strong and healthy. And yeah, I think that's a, uh, that's a good sign of things. So, so yeah. you, so you did go and how was it? Go. Was it okay? Um, it was, it was a lot. <laughs> Um, oh, I had never okay. done a computer. It was beautiful and gorgeous and good people. Um, but I did the spotting um, kind of like increased during that trip. And I was oh. like um, kind of mad at myself. Um, yeah. I was like, it was, yeah, it was just a really hard decision. And, you know, you don't know the right answer. And mm-hmm. now, of course, you know, looking back, you know, you never know. But um, but I was able to take like a rest day uh, so I didn't have to like, you know, I didn't push myself um, too hard. And then when, as soon as we got back, I like went to like a private ultrasound place to get checked out. And, oh, good. Um, okay. She was still fine. So it's okay. Like maybe I just like pushed myself and I'm just going to like try to take it easy. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. That is, that, I know <laughs> that would, that would make me worried if you're out like canoeing, camping, I'm not sure how, what that looks like, but it's like, that probably wasn't super easy anyway. Yeah. Ah, that's a lot. Okay. So you're just going along and you're still working, feeling okay. So tell mm-hmm. me a little bit more about some of your other appointments that you went to. Cause you don't, yeah. but you don't go, you don't go in that often at the very beginning. You don't, you don't. Um, and I don't even, I think we had a, a 12, when I got back from that trip, we did the, like, um, the nuchal translucency, um, where okay. they measure like the back and that's around 12 weeks. Um, yeah. The back of the baby you know to make sure to just check it out and it was normal and yeah. it looked good and like you get the cute little profile and ultrasound yes. you know it's like and baby actually starts looking like a baby instead of like a little blob yeah yeah totally so that was, yeah 
And so, like, I printed out that like little picture. I'm like, that's like, you look like a baby. You're a baby. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. I know that's always fun yeah. to to hit the, that milestone. Yeah. Uh, um, oh, and also, did the, um, sorry, at 10 weeks, like, um, you did, I did the blood test. And so I knew she was a girl. Oh, okay. So you did really want girl. to go ahead and do the genetic testing because um, you can do that pretty early. Yeah. Which is like, I swear. I yeah. Yeah. And then like 10 weeks. Mm -hmm. Did you do any of the extensive uh, genetic testing? Because I know some of uh, the basic one will will hit up what the the five major. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, did you do any more? Because I know that you can do one where it's like 200 things or something like that. No, I just did the basic one um, for the trisomies and the the, the, the sex of the baby. Yeah. Okay. Um, And you wanted to find out. So that's so fun. Yeah, yeah. So I knew she was a girl really early, and I was really excited. Yeah, uh, and I knew her did, name. And I was like, oh, and like, you know, I had a list of names, but I was like, I always, I knew her name was going to be Samira. So I'm like, I don't even know why I made a really? list of other names. Okay, so tell me, give me a little bit of the history of why you chose the name Samira and why you're like, oh, this is obviously her name, even though I have this list. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. It's I in high school I wrote a book and there was a character named Samira and I don't I couldn't even tell you the name of the book now. Like I really, <laughs> but I just remember like the name Samira and I was like, that's the most beautiful name. Like I just love it and I also love that it was like um, you can shorten it to make a nickname like Sammy, which is like kind of like oh, that's um, so cute. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. And so I was like, I, I didn't really have a nickname growing up. And so yeah. I was like, I want my baby to have a nickname. <laughs> so. <laughs> That's, it's really a cute name. It's a beautiful, I think it's really a beautiful name. So you already yeah. kind of chose her name. Um, told, did you start telling people then at that time, family members or yeah. friends and everything? Yeah. I started telling family, I think after the 12 weeks, um, I think it was like Mother's Day where I started telling like, siblings and like aunts and stuff so yeah um yeah and so that was and I knew her name was I knew she was a girl and I already was telling people her name yeah so. yeah so fun yeah. okay and then you had um so you had the 12 so you had the genetic yeah. testing at 10 weeks your appointment around 12 weeks for um the nuchal translucency mm-hmm. And then I think it's just a lot of times it's just regular office appointments. There's not really any other mm-hmm. ultrasounds until like the major ultrasound at, you know, 18 to 22 weeks, about 20 weeks, right, essentially. Yeah. And how were those appointments? Were those okay? Yeah. So I honestly don't remember because um, there was like between that like spotting during the trip and like up until like there was a couple weeks of like everything was fine. Yeah. No more spotting. And so I was like, okay, that was just the first semester. And so um, I felt really good. And then at 16 weeks, and I don't know if I had an appointment during that time or not. I don't think I did. Mm-hmm. I think I had 12 weeks and then it was like a month later. So um, 16 weeks, it happened again. And I was like, so oh, some gosh, more spotting. No. Yeah. And at that point, it was a little bit different. And I just, I was like, I'm going to go in. Like, this is like past the first semester. I want to get checked out. And so it was the first time I actually went to, our triage at our hospital and like check myself in officially to get um, checked out. Okay. And, and you mentioned, you said this is a little different at 16 weeks. Was it just like, was it like more blood or what? I mean, you, that yeah, really caused the concern. I think that now it was more, it, when it wasn't like bright red, it was still pink. Um, mm-hmm. But it was just, was like, it just didn't feel right. Like the first trimester in my head, I could rationalize it. Um, right. Yeah. But in the second trimester, I was like, I, don't like I didn't feel comfortable with it and yeah I was like and people I think I, I think I had started telling people at work so I was like I'm just gonna go in yeah so okay so um tell me about that appointment that or that uh that getting triaged and how that looked yeah like I was hoping like I really thought like I'm gonna go in and they're gonna say it's totally fine like um but they were doing an ultrasound to just look and one of the doctors thought he saw like um the cervix opening Oh, and that was just like a bedside ultrasound. So it's not super accurate. Yeah. So he was like, do you mind if I like do a cervical check? And just like, so it's like a manual like, feeling of the cervix to like yeah. feel if it's opening or not. Um, and so he did feel and it was, I was one centimeter. Oh, um, which is this... supposed to be close. <laughs> like, yes. Yes. Um, and this is, and you're at 16 weeks. 16 weeks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is weeks in a couple of days, but yeah. Um, yeah. And so I was like, that's not good, but I wasn't, kind of, there was like, I wasn't cramping. I was like not feeling anything. Um, so 
they were like, we're going to do a formal ultrasound. We're like, you know, like they, it's still in the hospital, but it's like, you get sent to like a actual, um, I forget what they're called, but like a person who actually does it. Like they measure everything. Yes. Um, so we did that. And then like, you know, you're waiting in triage and the results come back. And um, it was like, well, the good news is that it didn't look like on the formal. They He didn't see, or they didn't see what the bedside saw, which was like kind of like the, they call it funneling where it's like, mm-hmm really getting like open and thin um and so that was good yes but it was and it was the length was good okay so that's reassuring but it was still that was reassuring but it was still opening like on like the manual exam yeah and so what the plan was at that point was to um do like a serial like to like come back in like a week or whatever to continue to measure the, the cervicaling um mm-hmm. to make sure it's not shortening okay so that's so at that point, it's kind of just watch and wait. Watch and wait. Okay. And did they tell you anything else about like taking it easy, a- anything like that, just to kind of help you not let it progress? Yeah. I mean, I don't remember any specific instructions. Like in my head, I was like, oh, like what do, like, what do I do? Like what do I do? Like do I do I still work? Like do I like what? Like this is where I felt like I was like a new territory. <laughs> like yeah. I don't, you know, completely. Um, I would be like, oh yeah. I'd be twiddling my thumbs for like a week. <laughs> like, yeah. okay, you know what? <laughs> and I think I had, I think it's like, it was a long time ago, but I think, in, I think I had an actual, my OB appointment, like either that week or the next, like really soon. So mm-hmm. I think um, like in triage, like they're just kind of like catching you up and like, you know, yep. fixing what's like right now. And then like your OB kind of like makes the plan, or, you know, or like yes. follow up. Right. And so I think that was the plan was to follow up with the OB and decide kind of, yeah, like, did I need to be taken off work or like, and besides like the, the, the ultrasounds to measure the cervical length, was there anything else we needed to do? Um, right. so, but I, um, I don't remember when that, it was happening soon. Okay. And what was, so what did your, your regular OB say then when you did go in for that appointment? Well, I didn't get that far. <laughs> I, oh yeah. Um, okay. Go ahead. Um, that week I, what I did go to work and I remember one day like I was just like oh no sorry backtrack when I got home that night um mm-hmm. I looked at like the ultrasound results because in my chart like you know it's online or whatever right. like mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. the results and one thing that popped I was like trying to pour over like what's causing this I was like trying to read like the report and like see if there was anything abnormal and the one right. thing that popped up was like they measure the amniotic fluid or like and it said they didn't measure it like number you can but they didn't they just said subjectively low and like I remember that word like subjectively low and I was like in my head like my heart sunk because I think part of the um the discharge that brought me in it was like kind of it was a little like more watery and I didn't kind of realize that so thinking about it afterward and like analyzing and like you know all you have is time to think about yes about everything yes so when I saw that the amniotic fluid was subjectively low in my brain what if it's my amniotic fluid and that like, like my heart sunk because that's like not good. No, that the baby needs the amniotic fluid. <laughs> that is yeah. very necessary. Yeah. And like okay. my, like someone said, like my coworker was like, you know, if it's just, you know, a little dilation, like there's things we can do, like there's a cerclage where you, right. you know, do the stitch. But if it's your water, then you can't like fix your water back, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So so in my heart, like, that's what like I was like that week. I was like, okay, what if it's my water bag? And so I went back to work um, and I like, or I talked to one of the doctors and they're like, well, it's really early. Like for the, you can test the amniotic fluid and something called like, um, there's something that comes up when you look at it that like tells whether under a microscope that tells whether it's um, like uh, amniotic fluid or just like, or just yeah, some, just, yeah, whatever. yeah. Um, and so I was like, um, can I do like, let's do that. Um, and like, I kind of like, you know, I shouldn't say this, but like I did it on myself, <laughs> like try to like to see like, and like, I couldn't really, it was like, I can't really tell. I, okay. It was like, I, like, I don't know. Um, And so like that week I was just kind of like trying to do research and like, I don't know if I had reached out to the doctor, if I was just waiting for my appointment, but um, um, that Friday, so I, uh, everything that happened with the ultrasound and the checking the cervix was on Monday. And then that okay. Friday when I was back at work, um, I was taking care of a patient and I was standing up and then I, at that point I was wearing pads. Um, and I felt like I felt fluid and I was like, that's different. Like I've never felt like it actually come out. And so 
um, I, my patient had transferred. And so I talked to my charge nurse and I was like, Hey, like on my break, I think I need to check in and get checked out. And she's like, don't wait for your break. You're going to get checked out right now. <laughs> like, go, go, go over yeah. now, right go, now. <laughs> yep. Yep. Right now. So it was like an official check-in and, um, when they do the speculum and they do the swab to test mm-hmm. for like the amniotic fluid. Um, and so like, I'm just waiting, like, I mean, I'm in my scrubs, like my, like my scrub top, like yeah. my pants are out. Like, also, it's just like very surreal to be like at work that you're the patient now. Mm-hmm. And then, so I'm waiting for the results, like just like my heart's beating, um, just like waiting. And then the attending doctor comes in. And at that point I knew because, um, at my hospital, it's like the residents do everything. And then if there's like any bad news or things serious, like the attending comes in. And so I, I don't know if I said it, like asked, was like, it's my water, isn't it? Or something. And she was like, yeah. And I just started crying. Like I just, um, and I think my charge nurse had come in at that point and she was like hugging me. Um, and so, yeah, it was really awful like I really didn't want it to be that like but my heart knew I feel like that whole week I knew that's what it was oh oh yeah uh, uh. so just to just to clarify for others um on this podcast and some of our listeners is that um the reason why the water if your water breaks this early um this uh, and and I'll let you maybe tell a little bit more about some of the things that you probably tell people during in triage and and things that can happen if your water breaks at 16 weeks. Right. So there's a couple things why it's not. I mean, the number one risk is that once your water breaks, it's um, you are at risk for infection mm-hmm. um, because that barrier that's like keeping baby safe is now open to like the. The environment yep. yeah like the yep. vagina. so it's like bacteria can come in and the risk for infection is really high yeah. um to the baby like and, the, yeah to the baby right? and to you like i mean yeah. The, yeah. every like everybody's at risk mm-hmm. it seems like yeah yeah it's right yeah it's for both um and it can be very like it can turn septic and so it's that's very mm-hmm. serious and then why it's not like good for like that early for the baby too is that the baby uses the amniotic fluid um for the lung development like yeah. it like um, like takes in like it's like using like, for practice but the lungs grow because of the amniotic fluid right. and so then there's no amniotic fluids um, then the lungs don't grow or can't grow um, and so even if you don't get the infection and you are able to make it to like what they call viability which is like, usually around 24 weeks um, which is like also like high risk at that small gestation but then for if you sure. look for a baby at that small gestation with the lung like really undeveloped lungs like it's just it's very unlikely that the baby will survive you know yeah. even if you make it to the viability so it's just like it's just not good yeah thank you so much for that explanation just so that everybody understands the kind of the gravity of why you would start sobbing and uh when when you got that news that it was the amniotic fluid yeah what what did the attending start talking to you about um at that time right um, so at that time, it's like, obviously she gave me a moment and was like, we can talk yes. to you later. Yes. Um, so when they came back in to talk about, you know, what to do is like, obviously their recommendation would be, um, to end the pregnancy that like, I was like, I can't do that. <laughs> like she, her heart's still beating like, and everyone's decision is their decision for their own reasons. And I respect that. But for me at that time, I, I, if I was okay, which I was at the time. Yeah. And she was okay. Um, then I had to like at least try and you know, um, but I knew like um like obviously if I was starting to develop an infection or whatever, like that would have changed things. Um right. but at that time I was like, No, I you know, I understand the risk, but um, you know, I wanna I at that time I really didn't know what like trying or, you know, saying like what that meant. Like I would do like, you know, I would look into it later on and whatnot and we can get into that but at the time I was like I'm not ready for that that's yes. n- not happening I was like but I asked about antibiotics like, can we get started on antibiotics now and they said no and I was like I was really surprised at that and I think it's because of the it's just not like they don't I don't know whatever like backed up like you know they do evidence-based research or you right. know whatever and it's like I think it's like it hasn't proven to basically okay um, and I don't know if like there's more harm you know the harm versus good um yeah so I was kind of really like 
like I felt desperate. I was like, there, what can I do? I was like, antibiotics, like, can I have that? And they were like, no. And I was like, what? Like, so yeah. that was really hard to hear. Um, but yeah, and then the high risk doctor was going to be at the hospital the next day. So like, right. why don't you come back tomorrow and you can talk to the high risk doctor and like, you know, get more of an idea of like where to go from here if you're going to yeah. stay pregnant. Yeah. So uh, I went home from work. Obviously, I went I'm home so- from work and I did not go back. Like yes. I was off of work. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Um. So you got off work and then you came. So you did come back in then the next day to talk to the. Um, I did. Right. Okay. And what did they say? And how are you feeling? Well, like, was it still like, I, cause I've had my water break once before and it just kept coming. I swear it was like, were you leaking the entire time? Yeah. Like it was like, um, spotty, like a little pink tinge spot. Like, mm-hmm. like it wasn't like huge gushes. Um, but it, yeah, I had to wear pads. It was, it would yeah. continue the whole until she was born. Okay. Um, cause she would still make. She would still make any other fluid. Right. Um, right. But it would just come out and sort of stay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you came in the next day. Uh, I talked to one of the mater- with MFM's maternal fetal medicine doctors, which is mm-hmm. high risk doctors. And it wasn't good. It wasn't like I was hoping for, like, I don't know, like some sort of like hope or like plan. Like, and it just wasn't good news. It was like, recommendation again about like ending the pregnancy and then she had to go over she's like I know you probably know but I still have to say like all the risks that are associated with staying pregnant at, you yeah. know this early anyway so she went over that and it was just like oh like there is nothing really they could do for me mm-hmm. and that was really hard because I was hoping to go in and like hear some like something you know like and the the, the only thing she said well if you're still pregnant I think you're like 23 weeks you could get admitted and we'd start antibiotics and you know, like you'll be admitted until you deliver at that point. So you'd have to make it like, what? And it was 17 weeks at that point. So it would be like six more weeks. Like, yeah. That's a long time to stay pregnant and not get an infection on. I yeah. like from what I've talked to people about. So that yeah. is, yeah. Okay. So what, so you went home and did you just hang out and yeah, not do anything? Well, yeah, I put I basically put myself on bed rest. Yeah, <laughs> like I yeah. got up to go to the bathroom and to like um, get food, and that was pretty much it. Um, um, I did keep my appointment with, so I had that OB appointment. I don't know yes. if you remember, like I yes. had scheduled after, and so it was like that week, and so I kept I did go, and he actually I asked for antibiotics. He was like, well, like you understand the risk. Like I he did like prescribe antibiotics, so like I felt like I was doing something like it, even if they didn't help like it was helpful to me that he basically heard that like that's what I wanted and yeah so I started antibiotics I um, found this it's called T-Prom it's like an organization um, and there's like this whole community online about this happens a lot and I had no idea mm-hmm. but there's a whole community that this happens and like women have come together to like like share tips and like it, whether or not it's I mean, I don't know how like re- research backed it is, but like somewhat like high high doses of vitamin C and lots of water and like all these other supplements and like trying to like um because sometimes depending on how the bag breaks, it's possible that it could reseal if it's not like a gross grossly like rupturing, you know, if it's like a small like, yeah. ache or right. Um so, like you hear like you hear all these like miracle stories of like, you yeah. know. So I really clung to that and, and I was like, or just like, just like preventing infections or like, you know, being on probiotics and it was just trying like anything prevent infection. That- yeah. Mm-hmm. Anything. Right. Stay hydrated. And I did that for um, 17 weeks when it officially got diagnosed until um, about three, three weeks and two days. So I was um, 20 weeks and two days when um, I started going into labor. Basically. So, oh. So you just, yeah. you started feeling cramping and contractions then. Yeah. 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 And it was weird because it was three weeks. It's like you have like, especially you know what I know. And it's like, you have like this, you're holding hope. Like you have so much hope that your baby is going to be that miracle baby. That's going to survive and survive. And then have like the lungs are going to be like, they're going to be you know, like all, like all the different levels of sort like, you know, like the next yes. thing and the next thing. And like, mm-hmm. and it's like, you read those like stories and like, maybe it'll be my baby. Um, then I also like there's other half of me that's realist. I'm like, 
this baby's not going to make it. Um, so it was like really weird to like be in that like waiting, basically waiting period. <laughs> yeah. So you s- started feeling contractions and you had thus far, you had avoided any sort of infection mm-hmm. that you were aware of. Um, mm-hmm. And so, but you ended up going to the hospital because of the the contractions or wait, did you not go into the hospital when you got contractions? I did. So that morning I had had like eggs and like garlic, a lot of garlic. For, and I know like sometimes it upsets my stomach. So at first it felt like mm. well, maybe I just had like ate too much garlic. And then it, it felt like contractions. Like, I've never felt contractions, but I obviously work and I describe them all the time to patients. So like, yeah, I was like, shoot, like it felt like a wave. Like it felt like it started slow and then it grew and then it went away. And at this point it wasn't painful, but I was like, this is a contraction. This isn't like, I know what this is. Yeah. And so I went in because they weren't, like I said, they weren't painful yet, but I was like, this is how it starts. And I knew that. So um, I had texted my, I don't really have family in the area. Um, so I knew my support people who I wanted to be at the birth. Um, so I had texted them kind of like as I was going in, I think to give them a heads up, like, Hey, like, cause they had been kind of on standby. Right. Cause they like, yeah, yeah. they knew it could happen at any time. Right. Um, and so I was like, I'm hoping it's not what this is but I am going to the hospital to get checked out. So just okay. like, cause they're like three ish hours away. Oh, okay. Yeah. So a little bit of a drive. So that's good to just kind of, yeah, give them a heads up. Yeah. Um, so when I got there um, to the hospital, um, my heart rate was like in the one forties, <sighs> which is high. High. Yes. Um, yeah. I surprised that I didn't have a temperature, um, but the baby's heart rate was also high, which is also oh. a sign of like infection. Um, and at the time, I'm trying to think, um, I was still hoping to, that this wasn't happening. So like they wanted to like check my cervix with their hand mm-hmm. to see if I was dialing. And I asked them not to, cause that's like, it could increase infection risk. If, um, yes. I was still kind of like, I guess in denial, but anyway, so they did a speculum, which is like more of a sterile exam mm-hmm. to see if they could see anything. And the cervix, they said, looked about the same, like one to one and a half centimeters. Like visually it's not the most accurate, but it wasn't like super open yes okay I was like, okay, like well they're not causing not causing my cervix to open so maybe like I was still kind of like maybe we can like get this like get some fluids I know like, like make the contractions go away um, but yeah. then it just got worse it's just in like in the span of an hour it went from like zero to 60 where they became so painful and I was in so much pain oh. and I like I was starting to throw up and I was like I couldn't <gasps> stay in bed and it was like it went, happened so fast and they had drawn some blood Uh Just check for infection, and that had come back. And like one of the one of the tests is like a lactic acid, and that was elevated. So it was like, yep, it's yeah. So, um, luckily, like I forget, I think it's this afternoon. It's the afternoon by this point, and they're like, well, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna admit it, and this is happening. And I, oh, while I was having all that pain, I was like, okay, I think you need to check my cervix now because now it's like painful. And so when they did check, it was three centimeters. Oh, it was it was happening. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, baby's heart rate, how was it at that time? Was it still kind of a, a little elevated? So because I was only 20 weeks there and the situation, they're not continuously monitoring it. They just do a spot check in the beginning to see if baby's still alive, basically, okay. and to get like a number. And then it's not being monitored. Okay. Okay. So it was just that one time it was like 170s and normal is like below 160. So they get you guys, get you checked in and um, going through this, you are in a lot of pain. And yeah. did, did you, I guess in the time that you were, I know that you're holding out hope, right? Like, but like there was probably a realist part of you that was, had some thoughts of like, okay, if I need to give birth and mm-hmm. what was that going to look like? Did you, did you think about that or what you wanted during the birth if um if it were to come sooner than later yeah so I think as soon as like those contractions picked up and became painful then I knew like this this was happening today um it I, like I just like so I, there was no hope after that and at that point the pain was so intense that I just honestly wasn't even thinking about like the birth I was like I want an epidural <laughs> like okay. you know like like that was my focus at that yeah. point it was okay. it, it was unlike anything I've ever felt um and it happened so quickly and I was just like I felt so out of control like mm. uh, and that was really hard like I was just 
the pain was, uh, yeah. So I was, I was like, I need my epidural. I need the epidural. Okay. Um, and so I got into a room and got an epidural pretty quickly. And it was the most amazing thing. Like, it just, I felt like it gave me back my sanity. Like I could like breathe and then I could like think about like the next yeah. step, you know, like I became like a normal person again. Yeah. So, yeah. Cause that pain can really like, oh, it's so distracting, right? Like it did. <laughs> okay. So you got the epidural on contractions are happening regularly enough or are they still kind of sporadic but just quite painful i mean uh, after before, epidural, I, I don't know <laughs> like they yeah. went away with you know with epidural yes. like i think yeah. um i think there is probably still happening but like i don't i actually i don't know because i got the epidural and i didn't feel anything great um, yeah which is nice um and the doctors they wanted to start giving medicine to like speed things up um originally um because of the the infection um and I asked them not to because I wanted my family there and they still had it. They still, they're on their way. Okay. And so I know from experience that the medication can make things happen very quickly, especially very. if you're already kind of in labor and yeah. it's premature. So all that stuff. So, and I think at that point, by the time I got settled in the room, they redid the blood test and um, with the boluses and the antibiotics, like things were already getting better. And so I wasn't, things weren't critical. So they said, yes, we can wait until your family gets Okay. There. So. Okay that felt good to me. Um, and yeah. then, and so, and they were able to come in because once again, you just don't know, quite know what the, especially during COVID. So there was a lot of restrictions. So your yeah. family was able to come in and be with you. Is that right? Yeah. So in my, so I had only asked two people because those were the two people I wanted at birth of her. At the time you could have two people. That was the, yeah. the number. Okay. And so I didn't even think, and we do at, at my hospital, least, like we would make exceptions for lost families. Um, yeah. But I didn't even think about one asking the hospital again for that exception or even asking other people. Like I, I was like, are these my two people? They're coming. Like I, so that was, that was fine. That felt good to me. But like, I'm like, oh, looking back, I'm like, I probably could have had more people if I, if I wanted, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. Did they get there in a timely fashion <laughs> were they able to get there yeah. in the t- in time yeah. essentially yeah luckily they did it was like um like maybe 5 p.m 6 p.m at this point and they both got there at the same time they're coming from different cities so it was kind of funny they walked in together it was my sister and my uh, stepmother um, okay yeah and at this point like emotionally i was like i wasn't like crying at this i think i just kind of accepted like this was happening and then my sister's really great at distracting and that's exactly what I needed. Yeah. So she was like, kind of like just talking about other like story, like her kid, like something. And I appreciated that because I needed, I needed to be distracted at that point. I know that's mm-hmm. not the case for everyone, but like it was helpful to me. Um, yes. Yeah. Your brain can only take so much like, yeah, that anticipation and the grief and all of that. And so, that, yeah. yes. Yeah, I found myself, we found ourselves laughing at the hospital after our son was born, even though we were like, this is, we shouldn't be laughing, but you, your body does need a break sometimes. Um, Okay, so they, they got there. Mm -hmm. You're still probably contracting just because um, you're going, did they end up starting you on something to start speeding up the process or no? Or were you, were you like, laboring pretty regularly now contracting pretty regularly right um honestly i still wasn't feeling anything i had a great epidural and yeah. it was change of shift at this point mm-hmm. and so they were waiting for the next doctor or the next like basically right. a change of the doctors and nurses yes. um to like basically check to a, a cervical check and then see if i needed the medicine at that point yeah. um and so um it was going to night shift and i worked at the time i was working night shift um so it was like all my my people um coming on and, um, and so, and the, the doctor actually from day shift stayed, she wanted to, to stay for the delivery. So that, oh. that was really, um, yeah. I don't know, like meaningful, like they work crazy hours. And so the fact that she was wanted to stay anyway, but yeah. So very kind. she just shift, I got my nurse who was phenomenal. Um, you know, and that must be hard because she knew me as a friend as well. Yeah. You know, like. So it, I know it's not an easy assignment to take. So I'm really grateful that she chose to um, yeah. to take me. And yeah, so they check and um, basically they, I don't need the medicine. It's like it's, 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 they could feel like she was there basically. And so I just, um, it was basically time to push. Um, 
So, and they had asked me with a plan, like, if she, you know, what do you want to do after she's born? Like, do you yeah. want her to the skin? Do you want us to, like, kind of clean her up and then give her to you? And I had, like, kind of, I knew, like, I knew how things went. So this is, like, I know it, it sounds weird to say, but, like, it's kind of comforting knowing what to expect because yes, I think I'm prepared. Yes. And it gave me so much more empathy for our patients who don't know what's going on. Like, right. So just like to have the situation that we have and then also like all these like unknowns and like what's going to happen. Like I had some background. I knew kind of what to expect to happen. And for me, that was like so comforting because I could like anticipate and expect. So anyway, that was a side note. But no, yeah, it's, um, I think it's a great side note because, yeah, there was definitely when you kind of know like how your baby's going to look. Or you can ask for certain things like skin to skin. And um, I think that really does help considerably with the experience, right? Like you you know, it's going to have a likely a bad end, but to have some things that you can kind of hold on to or just focus on that. I don't know that that would have helped me when I went through that. So um, yeah, yeah, it, may, it makes me, I feel like a different nurse now going yeah. through it, obviously. But, um yeah, I have so much empathy for it. So, yeah. Anyway, um, so continuing on. Um, yeah, so I, I decided that if she was born alive, because I did at this point we didn't know, and um, if she was born alive, I wanted her skin to skin right away. But if she wasn't, um, I had told them like I want to you like just you know wrap her up or you know and then bring her to me, and that was like earlier on in the day. And then at this point, when I kind of like, I kind of like the way. Like she was like, I don't know, not to get into too many details, but in my head, like I was like, there's no way that she will be born alive. So when it was time to push, I was like, can you just take her and clean her up and then bring her to me? Um, like, don't like, I don't want her skin to skin right away. Um, okay. Okay. It, she's going to be in my mind, like not, not alive. Yeah. And so I didn't push. I mean, she was so little, she was only 20 weeks, um, in a couple of days and so I only pushed uh, not very much a couple couple times maybe um and she was born and that silence that everyone talks about it you know I've heard a hundred babies cry and um just to have that silence is really hard um and so they took her to the warmer and I wasn't I don't think I was even crying at this point I was just like um, like it, it happened it's like I was almost in shock yeah and then the nurse came over and she like there she's she's alive <laughs> like she like she was like throwing her arm up like she was like you know she's she's alive and sorry um you know like I was like and that's when I like I broke down like I just lost it because I wasn't expecting that and yeah like, yes they brought her over to me and like like she was so tiny but she was so perfect like I was just like amazed by how perfectly perfectly formed everything was on her and like she was beautiful like, she was just like the most gorgeous thing I've ever saw like I just like I couldn't stop looking at her and I was just like oh my gosh like you you're you're perfect and I just like I told her I told her how much I loved her um and I told her how sorry I was and I I just apologized to her. Um, I felt like over and over because like in my mind, she was just this perfect baby and she was just born too early, you know? Um, so yeah, so I feel, sorry, I feel grateful that I got that time with her and, um, and she, she was on my chest, um, for, and she lived for about her heartbeat for about an hour. Um, so I got about an hour with her. Oh, that is amazing that's amazing um so you got to hold her and um you talked to her it sounded like um yeah uh what other things were you able to do while while she was with you no it's it's like kind of weird because I had all this time to prepare and I didn't prepare like for what to do after like I didn't like I've heard you know on your podcast people who read books their babies or like brought special things to wear and I didn't do any of that because I, I don't know if I just was in denial but like I, I feel like I had all the time to do that and I didn't so I just talked to her, her and like I remember like I think I told you about her nose was just mm -hmm. so perfect and so I just remember like 
rubbing like her nose like her forehead to her nose like it was just like this perfect like like her face was just so perfect and round and I just was like just sorry just touching her um and talking to her and yeah I mean it was just spending time with guys that's all like I I didn't do anything but one thing I wish I had done Mm -hmm. because my family they asked if I wanted like a video or the nurse asked if I wanted the video and I said no like at pictures like I took we took some pictures but at the time I was like wait like no and I really wish I had a video of her while she was living but yeah so so we just spent time with her and I remember I was feeling her her umbilical cord to see if her heart was still beating um I don't know why but like I I really needed to know like when like when she passed like I wanted to know like not the exact time but I just like was she still yeah alive yeah um because when they're that little it's not like her eyes are like her eyes are not open like right. um and so it was kind of really hard to tell whether she was alive still um but about an hour is when I didn't feel any more um, um of the heartbeat and I I kind of towards the end like I wanted her to go because in my mind I was I didn't want her to suffer you know like I was like I didn't want her to feel any pain um so I really I just I I was like I think I told her I was like you can go you know yeah and then you know they wrapped her up and my family got to hold her and that was really special um and you know I was worried I was worried that what they would think of her because she was so little and you know I'm used to seeing little babies but they don't look like full-term babies and um but they just loved on her and I felt very grateful they got to meet her and you know later on like co-workers who you know they asked if they could come in but they came in and they got to meet her and I it's it's so wild thinking about it like more of my co-workers like my work family met my baby than my own family like and that's just like it blows my mind sometimes like yeah just the nature of your yeah. situation and yeah. but also um there's something kind of cool about that too because you're you you spend so much time with your coworkers and you you are in it with them a lot of times, especially in L and T. So I it's kind of kind of cool too that they were able to to meet her. Yeah. Did you announce oh, you had already told it you were already had told people what her name was, right? Yeah. yeah. Did you officially say it is for sure this now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was Samira. She was just, it was like perfect for her too. You know, like you just like, yes, your name is Samira and that's, that's who you are. Um, she said she was just so beautiful. And yeah, my nurse, like, I remember the word she, like she said to me, it was like, because like when she was born, like she like was like throwing her arms up and she was like, she's so strong. And like that, like those words, like, stay with me like she's perfect and she's strong and she's beautiful and it's like oh like you know like you hear those you know like it's exactly what I needed to hear about her you know yeah oh you nurses are amazing (laughs) just (sighs) back on the nurses that we had and I just am so so grateful for yeah it always warms my heart when I hear people have great nurses and then I get really really sad for people when they don't have you know good experiences so one thing that happened with the early having an early baby too is that the placenta was having a hard time yes. coming out. Yes. And I in my head I don't want to go to the OR. I want to spend as much time with my baby as possible. And luckily, like I wasn't bleeding. Mm-hmm. And so they gave me time, and it was like four hours later. <laughs> like it was a long time before it oh. came out. But I just remember like. Like, I realized, like, and everyone, you know, no one wants to go to the OR. Um, even the doctors and nurses, like, we don't want patients to go to the OR, but at the times you have to. Yes. But I was just so grateful that it came out on its own. They gave me time. I was stable enough. But, like, thinking about the whole delivery, like, I always say, like, I hate that it happened. And obviously, I wish Samira was here. But, like, everything happened as good as it could have happened, if that mm. makes sense. Yeah. For the situation. That is a blessing for them to like give you the time to, to be with her and, and then not because it really like when they're delivering the placenta, it really so much to do. Like <laughs> it feels like there's kind of a lot involved, and and so that's that's really cool. Yeah. What is your hospital's policy for how long you can keep 
um, your baby with you. I just some yeah. some hospitals are very strict about it, and others are just like, yeah, keep keep them as long as you want, kind of a thing. Yeah, so I'm lucky that our hospital obviously has like a cuddle cot, and um, oh, great, so yeah, as long as you want, as long as you're there, you can have the baby there. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, so she was there. I only stayed. She delivered that evening, uh, Saturday night, and then. I really wanted to get home as soon as possible. I mean, I wanted to spend time with her, but like, I also wanted to get home. I didn't want to spend another night there. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I was like about 20, a little less than 24 hours after she was born. I was just charged, but, and I kept her up until like 10 minutes before I left okay. the room. Yeah. yeah. Um, I forgot to ask, um, did they end up, how big was she? How much, how much did weigh, she weigh and how mm-hmm. long was she? Were they, yeah, did they she, do that? I'm not sure if that, I mean, if they were able to do that that quickly and everything. They did. Yeah, they do. Cause they take her to do like picture, you know, do the little pictures and um, measurements and what and footprints and all that. And she was only 11 ounces. She was really tiny. Um, so tiny. She's about, I think I was looking at like about, about the size like of, a, of a soda can, you know? Yeah. Um, and I want to say she was like nine and a half inches long. Oh yeah, so little. Yeah, little, yeah, so little. Um, like I said, she had this like round head. I was like, this like perfectly like round head, and uh, yeah, so she looked, she looked perfect. Oh. So you um, kept her right up 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 until you discharged, and so my family went home. Like after she was born, they okay. stayed a couple hours, and not home. Sorry, they they got hotels, so they right. Um, stayed um, close by and then they came back in the morning to like visit and then they left and which was good because I I'm like I feel very um, responsible for people so like mm. I wanted to be by myself because if they were there I'd be worried about them if that makes yes. sense like oh are they comfortable have they eaten have yes. they like what yeah you put on hostess mode right and you're yeah. just trying to while well, you definitely need your time your time to yourself and time to cry and all that okay right. so they ended so up I left, leaving I, I left the hospital like a lot well first like so they they were like I knew I wanted to leave before change of shift so like when you know when when will they take the, you know when do you want us to take her and I was like never but um yeah I was like I guess right before I leave and so that was so hard and I know everyone says that it's like so hard to see them take your baby like yeah. Knowing that you're like I wasn't, I wasn't going to see her again because I didn't want to see her at the at the funeral home, and so it was like the most final goodbye. Like, um, and I was like, I while I was on bed rest, I had made a playlist for Samira of all these songs. Like, um, and so like when she was leaving, I was like playing it, and it was like the one song. It's um by I think Christina Perry. It's like I don't even know the name of it. It's like the song where it's like I have loved you for a thousand years. Yeah. You know that one? Yeah, yeah. I think it's, so that I think it's called A left. Thousand Years. <laughs> what? I think it's called A Thousand Years. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, that makes sense. But like, like that was like just how I felt. Like I've loved you before you were born and I'm going to love you forever. And when she left, like, like that was just, it was just devastating. Yeah. Um, and then I, I was like, I need, I need to leave. So I left um, shortly after. And I think being alone like I like I was alone and and that didn't bother me so much as like in my body I felt alone if that makes sense like I'm I'm a bigger person and so at 20 weeks I didn't really feel pregnant still like and because I lost my fluid I didn't really feel her moving too much yeah and so I was like I didn't really feel pregnant until until she wasn't there anymore and so when I left I just remember feeling like oh my gosh like I feel so alone like in my body like I am alone and that was like a really surprising feeling when I was leaving. That and that's a hard feeling to be with a lot of times for a lot of yeah. people. Yeah. So that evening, right? Because you, what time did you just discharge? Would you say? Um, probably like six six p.m. Six p.m. I needed to get like they wanted me to get my last dose of antibiotics or whatever before I left. And, right. Well, and I was yeah. gonna say, were you still? I know that you were, your heart rate was elevated, but you hadn't fevered uh-uh. yet at all. Okay. Okay. That's a, that's a blessing right there also. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you got your last dose of antibiotics on and then you headed out. Mm-hmm. 
and yeah. at home that evening. How was that evening by yourself? Like you said, you were alone and yeah. did you sleep at all? I, I don't think I would, honestly. <laughs> no, I, I honestly, it's a blur. Like I just, I don't know, like if I knew, like I was obviously just like, just sad. And then I, like, I think that alone feeling just like persisted for a long time. Like I just felt alone. And I still, I still have those two girls living with me and they didn't, I had told them I was going to the hospital, but they really didn't know what had happened. Oh. Um, yeah. <laughs> Until I came back and like, they were, you know, they were working and doing their own thing. So they weren't like in the house a lot, but I was just like, Oh, I have to tell them. You know, I don't have to tell them. And, yes. Um, I didn't want to talk to people too. That's another thing I had my stepmom. I was like, can you just tell people, call them? Like I cannot talk to people. I don't want to talk to people. I don't want to tell them what yeah. happened, you know? Yep. Um, so I delegated and that was like really helpful for me. That's huge. Just having somebody else be your spokesperson when you're like, I just can't, I don't have the processing power for any of that. So did they, yeah. did your mom tell the, the girls at the house or did you end up telling them? I did. I told them. And in, like it was kind of weird because like they're younger and like they were sad for me, but they didn't really understand. I don't think they really understood like how devastating this was. Yeah. Um, and they were like, you know, they're sweet and kind, but like there's only, they weren't, they weren't my support people, you know? Yes. Um, I had good support people, just not in person. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And you mentioned that your, your sister and your stepmom, right, came, mm -hmm. um, and they came and visited the next morning and then headed out. Is that correct? Yeah. 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 So I went home. I was um, by myself, which is how I, you know, I really did really want it that way. And yeah. But then, like, once I got home, I was like, I don't know what to do. Like, what do I do now? You know, and yeah. luckily, I got the six weeks um, off of work. For, oh, you did. That's great. Yeah. And like I said earlier, everything, I think, happened the best way because I was past 20 weeks, and she was born born living. And I don't know if I had delivered, like, a couple days earlier, and if she wasn't born living, like, I'm not sure I would have gotten that time off. And that's, like, awful to think about. That happens to a lot of women. And so, yes, that is once again, a blessing. Yes. Like, yeah. So you got, um, so you were able to take maternity leave essentially. Yeah. 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 Wow, that, that's a blessing. And I need, I needed that time. Like I could not yes. have gone back to work. So, yeah. uh, like, of course. Of course. Uh, Did you hear back yeah, from but, any of your coworkers? Cause you, I mean, you essentially were with them. They were with you. Yeah. Yeah, like everyone was checking in. Um, they were really, you know, really great in that. Um, I just didn't want to like engage. I know it was probably me. Like I didn't engage too much. Like they would check in and like, especially the ones that like really get it. It was like, you know, I've heard this before. Like you don't have to respond. Just know that I'm thinking about you. You know, like, and those like those are the best texts because like it is it's lovely to like be remembered and like to know that they're thinking of me. But like, I don't want to talk to you or I don't want to have to like reply, think of a reply to just like, those texts were really, or like cards and like yeah. things I didn't have to respond to were amazing. 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 Yeah. yeah. You had Samira taken to um, a funeral home. Um, what, I guess, what were your plans? Because you said that you did not want to see her after that. Cause maybe what, of what, you know, working as a L and D nurse and, and how bodies change and everything. So tell me yeah. about your plan or your thoughts about after she was taken yeah. and, and after you discharged. So I knew I wanted her cremated um, because I wanted her with me always, like wherever I was, like I wanted to like be right. Like, yeah, I wanted her in my house. So yeah. yep. that was like a new, like that was a really easy decision for me. And then I also knew that I didn't want to have like a funeral. Um, one, because like a lot of my more extended friends and family, like a lot of them didn't even really know I was pregnant. Like, I never announced on social media um, it was just kind of my immediate friends and family. And like some of them heard for the first time I was pregnant when I was like on bed rest. Like I yeah. kind of like sent an email out saying like, this is what's happening. And so I just, yeah, I didn't feel like I wanted to have, like I didn't have the bandwidth to, to plan in a funeral and it just felt not right for me. So um, what I wanted to do was like go off and, like be by myself <laughs> you know like I wanted to and I wanted to get out of my house and out of my town and so I, I knew I had this time off so I was like that's what I want to I just oh. need to 
me. Good. And as what did you end up doing then? I did. I went up to um, Southern Oregon um, to like there's um, like just really pretty woods and whatnot. And my sister let me stay at her timeshare. And in my head, I was like, okay, I'm gonna like go out and do stuff. And like really, I just probably sat there and cried a lot. I mean, I made myself go out, but it was like good just to get out. Um, and then my a group of my friends they were amazing. They were actually, I didn't know this at the time, but like when I was telling about when I was on bed rest, I had told them about like the situation and like how if she survived, she would be a Nikki baby and you know, all that. And they had actually already started collecting um, money for if, you know, for like to give me, I guess when she, if she was born in the NICU to help support like bills or whatnot. Oh my, oh my goodness. And so yeah, it was like so unexpected. And then when she obviously, you know, died. They just like they dedicated the tree in the redwood forest, and they sent me this like large sum of money that I used to like be able to like travel a little bit and not worry about money. And so that was like so kind and thoughtful. And that is so kind, yeah. Yeah. Because even that little bit of change of scenery is so helpful. Like, yeah. Especially when you're yeah, just when your heart is aching, it's just nice to like, yeah. like you said, even though you were crying, maybe just in the in the little timeshare. At least it was yeah. a different timeshare. A different, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, different area. I think, I mean, I did get out, and like you know, like I do feel like I feel her nature. Like I, like I just feel yeah. close to her, and like, and so yeah. So that was like, that was meaningful to me, you know. And I wrote my journal, and was able to like, you know, write letters to her. And so like, I did take the time to like, to do that, um, and be with her. Did you end up going to the funeral home and and then grabbing him, getting her? ashes then and how, tell me about yeah, that process that was like I wasn't like on them because I wasn't doing a funeral so it took a lot longer than I think normally like I think mm. it, it took like weeks to get her back which I don't think is normal I had a kind of like like bother like they were very nice on the phone but I'm not sure if they were busy or like I wasn't a priority because I wasn't having a funeral I don't know but oh, like I see. it took longer than I expected I see okay um, but then when I finally did get her um it was just also, like the you know they gave it to me. Like I had already um, bought her like a personalized little urn on Instagram uh-huh. or not Instagram. I'm sorry, on Etsy. Uh-huh. Um, so I was like, I was very. It's just beautiful, and I'll, I'll send a text to you. But it's um, so I had that ready for her. But when they gave her to me, I was like, I was kind of shocked at how few ashes there were. Like there's just she's just so little, and then like yeah just little yeah it's just so little so she's just you know um just the urn's very tiny and it's just like it's baby size you know um but it's beautiful and I have her like right like in my in my dining room like on a shelf <laughs> so she's right there um but I remember like when I had I I picked her up and I had to go I was on my way home but I had to start at Target and I I, I was like I can't I can't leave her in the car yeah, you can't leave her in the like, car. What am I, I can't I can't leave her in the car. And I was like, no. do I go home and drop her off? I was like, no, I need it. Like I like she can't. And so I was like, oh my gosh, like it was a kind of it's kind of morbid. But I was like, oh my gosh, like baby girl, we're going to Target for the first time. Like you're gonna come to Target, you know? Like like it was like it was funny and sad at the same time. It was yeah, because like, I had these all these plans of what I was gonna do with her, and I was like, well, I guess we're like going to the Target. Gonna, yeah, <laughs> yeah, we're gonna do our Target run. <laughs> like so, um, yeah. So it was kind of silly but um yeah and then you know I got her home and put her in like, her little her little urn but yeah that's where she is now that's wonderful Farah thank you so much for sharing your story of Samira is there anything else you would like us to um to know about her or anything that we missed in our in our talk yeah no I think I think I've told totally you this but like I just feel so grateful to share her story because I'm a private person. I don't feel like I talk about her enough or like, but like she was so real to me and she was like, she's my baby and I love her. And she was like a part of my family and my heart will always be missing. Um, so yeah. So just that, like she, she's my family. And like, I think to say her name, like I, like I will always, like, I'm always thinking about her. So like, I don't know. Just, she's so, she's real. She's my baby and I love her. That's perfect. Yes. And she is. She always will be. Thank you so much again, Farah. Thank you, thank you, thank you.